I'm still building up to text rendering. At this point, I know how to extract all the data that I need from a TTF file, but I don't know what I want to do with that data exactly. Today, I want to define a data structure that can contain everything I need from a font file so that I can close the file and cut off all of the interactions with the library. Let's quickly go over again the data I'm dealing with. I need a single bitmap that contains an atlas of all the rasterized glyphs for a particular size. I need an array of data giving metrics and UV coordinates for each glyph, and I need an accelerated map that takes code points to glyph indexes. Before I hop into the programming, I want to explain the logic behind what I'm going to do. One goal I have here is to abstract away the library, but I'm abstracting by data format rather than by a wrapping layer. Each of these arrows represents a data transformation. The names on the left of the arrows are the input data types, and the names on the right of the arrows are either output data or some output effect. The name above the arrow labels the data transformation itself. Now, in this case, the ultimate arrow I want is one with a TTF file on the left, that's the input data type, and text on the screen on the right, that's the output effect I want, the text rendering. So the worst thing that could happen here is that every time I add a new font parser, I add a whole new arrow of this kind. But a lot of what's happening in that arrow is completely unrelated to the specific choice of font parser. So the goal of abstracting in this case is to isolate the code that has to depend on the parser from the code that can be independent of the font parser that I pick. Abstracting by data format means I'm introducing a new type of my own design into this type flow graph. I'm putting it in between the original input and the original output. The idea is to design that type so that I can shrink these arrows on the left and therefore minimize the cost of supporting different font parsers. Another goal I have here is to organize the data that I produce from this path so that it can speed up the renderer. I don't want a really poorly organized data structure that makes for slow rendering. Here's where I'm going to be applying the principles from CS class, like selecting efficient data structures and algorithms, and all those good low-level principles like cache friendliness and tight loops and how to do that kind of stuff. All of that gets in play there. I'm trying to design my data to be fast in the renderer. So those two goals are my big ones here, and they're generally going to be in conflict, and today we're going to see how I'll resolve that. All right, so let's get started. First, I'll start sketching this out in the Scratch program where I already have the free type library working. My first step is to set up a loose data structure for gathering all of the parse data. I call it a loose structure because I'm not doing anything smart to organize it, and I don't intend to use it as the final output from all of this. This is not the optimized data structure. It's a linked list because it's built on a scratch arena, which means I don't have to know how big it'll be up front. I don't have to think about how to pack arrays or anything like that. It's more flexible. That's what it's oriented towards because I want it to be easy to extract data out of the font parser and just put it into this data structure right away without having to think carefully about how to place data as I'm extracting it. It might turn out that this initial design is too loose and prohibitively slows down the, the whole baking path that I'm building here. If that happens, we'll do another pass where we upgrade the loose structure just a little bit to make it a little bit more efficient in its way of packing things. Still not going all the way to being the final thing, but maintaining enough flexibility to be usable, but faster. Uh, for now, I'm just gonna maximize out flexibility and not spend time on speed when I'm not even measuring my speed yet and I don't have any limit on how fast I need this to go yet.
here, my loose font type contains all the rasterized bitmaps and position data for every glyph in the font, uh, but it's still missing the code point to glyph index mapping data, which I need to get to. However, before I do that, I decided it's a good time to pull out the parsing work into a separate function, and that way I have a nice clean split between code responsible for interfacing with free type and code that's responsible for font baking. Next, I want to complete this loose structure with the code point to glyph map. The loose version of this map will just be a list of pairs of code point and index. So it's not going to be hashed yet. It's not going to be sorted or anything like that. It's just a linear scan set up for now, but we're not actually going to have to use it for accelerated mapping. We're going to use it to build the accelerator. So that'll actually be fine. The loop I already had did all the things I needed to do, but it was printing out to printf. So I'm just going to take the existing loop for printing out pairs to printf and instead dump it all out into this, this loose code point glyph map data structure. Finally, I need to grab some metrics that are for the font's line spacing. These are metrics that are per face instead of per glyph. So they just get thrown at the top of the loose font structure rather than in some kind of linked list like the rest of the structure. <laughs> Here I have all the information I need pulled out of the TTF file and put into the loose font type. That means it's time to write the baker part of this. The purpose of this path is to take the loose font and output the version that is optimized for the renderer. So this is how I end up resolving the conflict between my goals for abstracting and optimizing the data. First, my parser generates this loose version of the data. The loose version is designed to be easy to construct and deal with, and it's not necessarily optimally organized. That layer is doing the abstraction part. Now I can easily create another font parser, and all it has to do is construct this relatively easy to build data structure, the loose version of the font data. Second, I have a single optimizer path that takes the loose version of the structure and turns it into the baked version of the structure. I should only ever need one of these paths, although I might spend a lot of time iterating on it and improving it because it's a big optimization problem. But this means I can afford to move all of the hard work onto this path so that I'm not duplicating the hard stuff, and I've made all of the stuff that it will get duplicated, the parsing work, as easy as possible by moving the hard stuff here. Now, having this loose intermediate might put a limit on how fast the combined path can be, but there are a couple of reasons why I'm not too concerned about this. For one thing, before I do make a highly optimized path that fuses all of this into one arrow, I would prefer to have it written in a way that is easy to get right first. That way I can test the optimized path that I'm working on with an already working, more likely to be correct path. Another reason I am not so concerned about this is that we're building an accelerator here, so that means it only has to happen once, and then the accelerated baked version of the data gets used over and over again for the text rendering from then on. So the pressure is really on the renderer and the structure of the optimized path to be fast, but the construction of the optimized path, like data does not necessarily have that much pressure on it to go fast. It might end up being something I want to do fast, but there's less pressure on it right up front. All right, so I think I've covered the structure of the system pretty thoroughly. Let's take a look at how it turns out. For my code point index map, I'm going to go with an externally chained hash table. As optimizations go, this is really not great. When we go to render strings, we'll often be handling between 10 and thousands of code points at a time. And 
there's a heavy bias in there towards ASCII characters. Most of the characters we render will be in the ASCII range. So with all of that, there's a ten, bunch of structure in the input string data that we're going to end up processing that we could use to make the code points to glyph index mapping even more accelerated than what we're going to get out of this data structure. This is actually kind of a cop-out. So we might need to come back and micro-optimize this on another pass, but for now I just want to get things working without belaboring the point. And this data structure is still pretty good. It won't make a super tightly optimized loop, but it'll get us pretty far. Now I'm faced with an even bigger task. I have all these glyphs with separate bitmaps. I know the width and height of them, but I don't know the x and y coordinates where they should get placed in the atlas, and I don't know the width and the height that the atlas itself needs to be. This is the rectangle packing problem, and I need to create an algorithm that solves it. Rectangle packing is a constraint optimization style problem. The constraints are that rectangles need to be non-overlapping and contained within the atlas rectangle. And the optimization is that we want to minimize the memory used to store the atlas. We want to minimize its width and height. I am not super interested in getting lost in this rabbit hole, so I'll whip something up that's very easy to implement and we'll move on. Again, this is something we're probably going to need to come back to and get more serious about when we are more interested in optimizing this later. Here's a quick description of the algorithm I came up with when I wrote this. So one, I start with some square atlas space. 64 by 64, I think, is the default I pick. And then I lay out each rectangle in the input into rows from left to right and then top to bottom. Rows are aligned at the top, so each time I put down a rectangle, their tops are all the same as long as they're on the same row. And I set the height of the row based on the high, tallest rectangle I placed in that row. That way I know that no two rows ever overlap. When I run out of room at the bottom of my rectangle or my square, I double either the width or the height, and I'm alternating between them. So first I double the width, then I double the height, and then back and forth. Every time I do that, I know for a fact that I'm creating a new space that is completely not covered by any rows. So then I can take that as the new square or rectangle space to fill and start placing rows again there, and I recursively do this, f expanding the space and then filling it with rows until I have placed every bitmap. I also put in some tunable limitations on this algorithm. I set a maximum size and a maximum rectangle for it to lay out and a few things like that just to rule out the worst case degenerate inputs that might try to break this thing. This algorithm also gets layout done in one pass with no relayout work, so that's kind of cool. And it doesn't require any complex mutating data structures on the inside to track what it's doing or where it's going or recursion or anything fancy or like that. It just takes in its input stream of rectangles, places them, and then tells you where it placed them on the way out. Okay, here I've finished writing the rectangle packing algorithm. The output from the algorithm has all the layout information I need, but it's still in this loose organization that the packer is outputting. So this is another loose data structure I've implemented here, which is just the chain of indexes and uh, uh, XY values that got chosen by the layout. So the final step is to decide how I want to take that layout data and pack it into the final output. Once I've done that, we should be good.
After all of that, I've written a lot of code, so I spend a little bit of time verifying that the results look good by inspecting them in Remedy and running some assert loops that just assert that certain properties are holding that I'm expecting to hold. And when that all looks good, I'm basically ready to say we've got all the building blocks ready for text rendering. To make any more progress, we're going to need to start combining things in the code base, so that's what we'll get to next. See you then!